Um, so to begin with, I'd like to ask uh, a general question regarding working in the medium of uh, autobiography. And uh, in particular, what is it like to sort of um, living and working in your own work, like using your life and your experiences um, and, and following from there, sort of like what are the, the highs and the lows, the, the times where you get like discouraged or want to get away from that, or experiences that you've had where you're like really pleased with the direction in which things went. And uh, let's go ahead and start with Gina and then we'll head down the panel. The hard part, I think, sometimes is not having distance from certain issues. Or if you're, if I'm working on a something in autobio where I'm not feeling uh, great about myself, um, it's hard to because a lot of my work is not straight up autobio. It's like a narrative version of it. Uh, so I think finding like the right process of uh, having time pass is difficult because if it's, uh, I'm the authority on me, if, if I don't know what I'm like talking about, that's like uh, hard. I, don't, I can't speak uh, right now. <laughs> but, um, do, do you find it's helpful to process these issues through comics? That's yeah. Kind of a, that's kind of like a sidebar I'd add for everybody yeah, as well. Yeah, it's very therapeutic to work in autobio and kind of uh, take things that are, I have issues I have in my life and to kind of just uh, make it into a stupid comic uh, it makes it uh, you know the separate entity from myself and like uh, better able to process mm, what's going on with me I guess <coughs> all right Sophia yeah um, I would say my m main motivations for doing autobio fall into like one of two categories the first is like if it's a story that's funny enough that I keep telling people over and over, I'm like, I'm just going to make a comic of it so that I don't need to keep telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was the impetus for my comic in Lovers Only, which was the um, teen romance anthology that Youth in Decline put out last year um, that Nikki and Kathy were in. Um, it was a story of like me on the beach with a high school girlfriend and we saw a car drive into the ocean. And it ended well. It wasn't horrible. It was like funny. Um, and I just told that story at parties so many times that I decided to make a comic out of it. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum is like, if something happens to me that's complicated or heavy or confusing and I wanna like externalize it so that I can talk to people about it more easily or like maybe find that it's relatable in some way, um, that's most of my work, I would say. Like wanting to nail down something complex and then see how other people respond to it. Chris? Cool. Yeah, uh, I guess my motivation for doing autobio comics is like, if I either want to remember something, I'll write an autobio comic about it. And also, if I want to forget something, I'll write one about it. Because, uh, like, if it's something funny, like, I'll probably come back and, like, read the comic and be like, yeah, that was really funny. I'm glad I wrote that down because otherwise I would have forgotten it. And then other times I'm like, I hate thinking about this horrible thing that happened. If I write a comic about it, then I won't ever have to think about it again because it will just be out there. And also you like, whenever, I don't know, this is not the same for everybody, but whenever I draw a comic, I like immediately forget about it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's great. So that, that's that. literally helping you process the bad feeling. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. I was like, I didn't know what processing was until like we were talking, and I was like, Sophia, what is processing? <laughs> and so Sophia was like, it's this thing. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Anna? Um, I guess my motivation is, uh, yeah, I, I, if I think a story is entertaining or interesting in my life, I'll, I'm willing to do it, or if it's like helpful. Um, so. I, and I go from like serious to, um, my, my more serious stuff, I tend to uh, make fictionalized, even though it's, it comes from a very like authentic like place in my life. So like I had a falling out with a friend 
in a, in uh, at last year, and so I did a comic about it, but it was a sci-fi story as opposed to like making it like an overly wrought auto auto bio piece. But then uh, the more humor stuff, I tend to just directly make auto bio, even though I draw myself like a crazy sweatshirt monster that doesn't look like me at all, and. Uh, and that, and then if I think like something will be helpful, or like, so I, I do some political work with it too. Like with my nib piece, is I interned for Hillary, Hillary Clinton, so I did a comic about my internship with Hillary Clinton and why, even though I was like the worst intern in the world and hate politics, I'm still supporting her. And uh, I also then like with the piece I did with Tilly Walden about our experience as a Planned Parenthood, I just wanted to shine like light on the fact that it was such a positive experience for me to be there that like I wanted to do a comic about it that would reach a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> next question is maybe slightly sensitive, so if you feel like passing on it, that's perfectly fine. Um, but of interest, uh, do you, does anyone have a, a therapist or consult with a, a, a psychologist or a, someone like that? And in particular, um, do you discuss your comics with them and sort of what are the, what are their thoughts on what you're doing? Uh, yeah, I uh, was in therapy for a little bit before I started doing comics, and I do think they're very related. Like, it took me a long time to go to therapy because I'm like, I know I don't have any real problems. Uh, no one's fucking me. That's making me sad. But uh, people are starving. <laughs> And um, <laughs> that was kind of why I didn't want to do autobio for a long time, or not for a long time, but just like getting interested in comics, I didn't immediately gravitate to autobio because I'm like, oh, my, I don't want to write about my stupid problems. Uh, but um, I think since I found therapy so helpful, uh, it, 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 then I was able to find how autobio could be helpful. And um, I currently not in uh, seeing my therapist anymore, but I did give her all my comics, and she was um, a big fan. I don't know. She said her husband read them and thought they were cool, and he's a photographer. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think uh, even though I'm no longer in therapy, I still get like good therapeutic help from doing autobio. Um, and I'm uninsured, so that's why I, <laughs> that's a cheap option to <laughs> do that. Sophia? Yeah, um, I am in therapy, and I have been since February. And shortly after starting, I did a comic about my therapist, and I brought it into therapy, and I gave it to her. And she was like, you drew this? <laughs> <laughs> I, and she was like, you did this? You drew this yourself? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And she was she like, like <laughs> Full screen again. She was like, wow, that's really something. <laughs> um, it made sense to her, I think, because like, my talking style in therapy is like similar to the voice I use in my comics, where I'm just trying to dissect everything. Um, I think the two are definitely related. It depends, because sometimes in autobio, you're just kind of showing something crazy that happened to you and sometimes there's a lot of internal monologuing where you're like going through your feelings at the time and trying to make sense of a weird situation. Um, I think that both methods are equally kind of therapeutic. Um, I think therapy is great. I don't consider them mutually exclusive but I think that going definitely helped my comics because it kind of gave me a sense of what insights are actually valuable and which ones are maybe kind of try it, if that makes sense. Hmm. C can you expand a little bit about that? Like, uh, what kind of, uh, what insights did you find valuable in try it and, and sort of talking about that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing would just be like trying to really pick apart the nuance of a situation. Like maybe pre-therapy, my reactions to traumatic events would be really one note. Um, and then the whole point of therapy is like trying to see something from multiple angles and kind of really understand it. So now when I'm analyzing situations and putting them in autobio comics, I'm trying to be more objective or maybe just a little more like to show an evolution of a point of view and not necessarily have one opinion the entire time. Chris? Uh, 
I, my parents took me to a therapist in high school and they were like, so tell me about your feelings. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I never went back again. <laughs> uh, but I drew all these cards. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> No, that's, 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 that's a totally valid answer. <laughs> um, and it's kind of interesting you tied into that because you're talking about processing as like a big therapy word, you know, like yeah. a therapy experience. I would have learned that if, I would have learned about <laughs> processing a lot earlier if I had stayed in <laughs> therapy, I guess. But it, um, seem, it seems as though like intuitively you found a way. Yeah, and I also, uh, if you ever hear me tell a story uh, that I think is funny, just like a train wreck like I'll be telling someone a story verbally and I can just see them like thinking about something else and being like being like I don't know where this story is going <laughs> so uh, that's part of why I draw comics because they're a lot better than me talking <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one thing comics are good for you <laughs> Anna? So uh, yeah, I've been in I've been in and out of therapy since uh, fourth grade, and um, I'm not currently in therapy. But the last uh, therapist I went to, I I gave her this comic, which was all about my mental health issues, and she ended up buying like 20 copies off me to give to people, which was really great. <laughs> um, but like I I haven't actually been doing comics that long, so none of my like. My other therapist knew that I really wanted to do it and like was flirting with it a lot, but never really, I never could really show them anything because I wasn't really doing anything. But um, yeah, so I, I have definitely talked about them in therapy. Here's a panel about her uh, Hillary Clinton comic where Anna asks why Hillary Clinton has a subscription to Hustler. <laughs> no. But, uh, the answer is, uh, since his, he won his Supreme Court case, that it was freedom of speech, that he gives all Congress people a free subscription to Hustler for, and it, it will go on forever. Because wow. that was, cause, yeah, so they will always, as long as Hustler's around, they all have, and then I was like, can I keep this? And they were like, absolutely not. And then, <laughs> and then this like gross guy was like, can I keep it? And I was like, you're gross. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I'll start with you on this next question. Um, when processing your work with a group or class, um, how do you facilitate conflict when the subject you're dealing with hits a nerve? Uh, okay, that's interesting. I think that at least, so I went to the Center for Cartoon Studies, and so I definitely, um, I definitely, uh, for a while, like, so all I did was with these 20 people that I was with for two years was just give, we, all we did was trade each other's work and, like, nitpick it with fine tooth combs and critique the heck out of it. Um, I would say that I didn't really come across where people were like, I think our class was kind of, like, against conflict, so we'd be like, so they, they, if they were not happy with something, they'd probably remain silent or be a bit sheepish about it. But um, uh, so I don't know about in terms of conflict, but I know that like it definitely collaborating and like having feedback was incredibly helpful. And then I graduated in May and moved to Delaware for like for a few months. And then I've just moved to Providence to, and I'm with some cartoonists again. And the difference between like doing this completely solitary versus doing it with a group is like tremendous because if, because for me, especially with the auto bio work, I will have like insane moments of self-doubt where I'm like, I think I just wasted two months working on the scene because I think it's terrible. And then someone will be like, no, it's really good. Or like, oh no, you just have to fix like this and this. And I'll be like, oh, okay, that's not good. So I think yeah. collaboration is super, like having a community is really cool with that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd, be, I'd be curious to hear everyone else's experiences with collaboration, whether there was or there wasn't, and and, um, and if you were in a, a formal environment, um, the way that Anna was. Well, we'll start with Chris. Uh, I mean, I went to school for illustration, but I never really like did comics for my class. 
classes or anything like that? Um, I guess most of the the like feedback I get is like uh, over the internet. Like I, I'll like be working on something and I'll be like, "Will someone please read this? <laughs> this is what I have so to do." Um, and then it's usually like I'll throw up like a a, doc, a Google document or something, and then like people can just be like, "This is really cool," or like, "You should change this part." And it's it's great because it's like there's like a lot of self doubt I feel like with with writing your own stuff and being like, yeah, this is a great story. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, so it's great to just have like an outside person like read it and be like, yeah, not the worst thing I've read <laughs> in my whole life. <laughs> Keep it up. Can't wait <laughs> to see it done. And then I'll be like, yes, if I finish this. One person will read it, <laughs> and they already kind of like it, so it'll be good. Um, <coughs> sort of in relating to the original part of the question, have you ever like done this with like in your circle, like thrown out like um, a personal experience or a subject in your personal experience where it's like, you know, what? What's you know that's strange? Really or that's like hated it? I necessarily hated it, but like really, it struck a nerve one way or the other. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's really tricky to offer personal autobiographical work for critique because people feel like they can't, like it's one thing to read a fantasy story and be like, you should maybe introduce this character earlier and maybe this plot arc needs an extra beat here. But when you can tell it's about someone's life, you can't just say like, maybe when that thing happened to you, there should have been another character. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's like, that's useless feedback for me. Um, and then the secondary level is like, even if it is fictionalized and you are open to changing the story, it might be about subject matter that's so personal that like people feel like they can't infringe on it at all. It's um, interesting that everyone's reaction to this is like, you're with people who like restrain their reactions for fear of like offending you. Have you had anyone who went the other way? I mean, when it goes the other way, it's just people who are like, this is garbage, I didn't finish reading it, and then it's like, that's not really constructive feedback, <laughs> so I don't know what to do with that. Yeah, it, was like, it because they were a, a, you, you, you dug into something offensive or bothered them? Or oh, sometimes, yeah, for sure. At conventions especially, sometimes people pick up something. And I remember one TCAF where I was tabling with Heather Benjamin, uh -huh. and this guy picked up her work, and then he threw it on the floor and walked <laughs> away. It was wild, yeah. I mean, there are all kinds of people here. Most of you are, are very nice. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and that's interesting because you're like, you know, um, you you want your you want your Ignats for sex fantasy, which is like this very personal and intense work. Um, what kind of reactions do you get to something that's that personal? I, I was really surprised by the reactions because sex fantasy started out as a very like. It was almost a sketch scene for the first three issues, and then it got more serious. And I'm, I have the seventh issue out now. Um, and I'm surprised that people find it so relatable because I wasn't trying to make it accessible. It was like a really personal thing. So people connecting with it was surprising, but great. <laughs> Trina, hmm. how about you? With Brown Herbs? What? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So basically, you know, do you have, um, do you have a, you know, do you have a sounding board group? Um, you know, what kind of reactions do you get? And um, and if you were if you were trained for art, if you went to art school, like what was that experience like? Especially in dealing with the kind of stories you do, and with kind of like the extreme nature of some of your gags. Um, I started doing comics when I was in college when I went to the school at the Art Institute and. Um, I don't know if it was a school specific thing or if it's a comic thing, but everyone is so excited when people make comics that I feel like no one is actually critical. And um, I never got any real criticism. <laughs> I don't know. Our classes were all pass fail, also. So that was cool <laughs> as hell. But um, yeah, I, uh, I. So I don't. I can't really feel like I trust someone's critiques of my work when I give it to them because that's what actually helped me get into comics is how welcoming everyone is or like even if I put out something shitty it's like cool uh, you 
you know, you stapled stuff together. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, I feel like the only way I really trust outside criticism is I've done a lot of uh, live readings, and I, uh, for about, for several of my mini comics, I've done a reading of them before I printed them. So going off of the audience's reaction of like, are they laughing or not laughing, uh, is more helpful to me than actually showing my work in a, a classroom setting or showing it to my peers. Has, has anyone else had experience with, um, with doing readings with their work live? Can you talk about that? Go ahead, um, Sophia. Yeah, I actually did a reading with Gina like uh, two TCAPs ago, mm -hmm. um, and it was for the launch of that Lovers Only anthology, and uh, Kathy, who also had a story in that anthology, we both had comics with two characters in them, so we did the reading of the second character in each other's stories, and that was nice. Um, I think the reaction was good, because that one wasn't really for, like, I wasn't looking for a specific reaction, so I don't know if I would have changed it depending on the audience reaction, but um, I think that's definitely like such a rare thing. People do comics readings in really different ways. Like Sometimes they erase the dialogue and they make it more of a performance. Um, you can at least tell if people are in connecting with it and like paying attention to it and enjoying it, so I think the easiest thing to gauge would be like how well it's flowing, if there are any parts where you're losing the audience attention. That would be easy to tell. Um, obviously, when you're doing, um, actually, go ahead, Chris. If actually you, had, I'll, I have a follow-up question to that, but I want to address it to everybody. So please go ahead with you. Oh, okay. Uh, I've did. I've done one comic reading uh, with Robin Chapman, um, but it, it was commuter, so it, it's all like funny stuff. So, oh, but I, it was like a group reading, and the person that went in, in front of me did a really serious scary comic about how she was abducted as a kid and she was done reading it and I was like I was like let's take a break let's take a break before I, I read this stupid comic about <laughs> sitting on trains and sitting in pee and stuff like that <laughs> uh, it was great because they're all funny comics so people were laughing that's actually can I add something to that like yes <laughs> the first time I ever saw your work was in the Koosh Female Secrets anthology, and your story was the one after mine, and mine was really dark and serious, and yours was really funny. <laughs> but at the time, I had the opposite reaction, where I was like, I need to lighten up. And my stuff is so like stodgy and dumb, and Chris's is so good and funny. <laughs> that, that comic was about farting on people. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you know that, like. It was literally like the anthology was like female secrets, and I was like, the female secrets are like dark and mysterious. And Chris's was just like, my secret is that sometimes when we're asleep, I fart on you. And I was like, my mind like opened up. I was like, I'm never going to be the same cartoonist ever again. Oh. Um, <laughs> follows, following that is difficult, but. Sorry. Um, <laughs> It's interesting. Can you compare the experience of, as autobiographical experience of uh, cartoonists, you're sharing often very intimate parts of your life with others, um, and how much how different is that in doing it in the performative space versus uh, the theoretical reader who might be looking at it? Oh me, <laughs> um, I think it's cool. Um, uh, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be an actress, and uh, Hollywood never called, so I turned to <laughs> comics, and I, I like being in front of an audience, and you know, you could put it out there, and then someone, you know, might send you an email or talk to you in person and be like, oh, I read this alone, uh, and enjoyed it, and I'm telling you now, but it's a whole different experience to be like, ooh, the audience is here, and um, I, I feel like it's all the, like, plus, I don't know, it's just, a, I love doing comic screenings um, also you don't have to deal with the anxiety of like you're not actually the focus you know there's like a slideshow or whatever that they're looking at so it's like you're not worried like oh my I look weird right now or something um, I love it and then uh, pretty much never done a reading where I'm uh, not incredibly drunk so it's just an excuse to be a mess and uh, people you know love you for it and uh, 
this will be looked back as a, a turning point of my Eat True Hollywood story of where I <laughs> start my downward spiral. And, um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I love doing live readings and performing. Sophia? Yeah, I think the there's an uncanny thing that happens with author bio sometimes where I'll like do a story that's really revealing and then someone will come up and be like, oh, I read this, I found the character's motivations kind of blah, blah, and they talk about it as if it's something that I wrote like completely dispassionately and it's not about me at all in a way that like I don't want to tell them because then I think they'll find it really awkward. Um, but they're like, yeah, this character is like so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes, it's interesting <laughs> to think about characters <laughs> like that. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Um, so that's awkward. <laughs> Uh, I only have done the one comic reading, and I was like, I had to get really drunk before <laughs> doing it, because I was really nervous, and I still don't, I mean, that was the only one I did, so I'm like, not super good at it, uh, but I think I feel more comfortable doing it now, especially because my day job, which is like storyboarding, I have to constantly be pitching the stuff that I'm working on, so I I had to get over it really fast because <laughs> I was like, I can't feel like this every week when I have to like show some drawings and read some dialogue to somebody because it is too much and I also can't drink at work. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't done a comic reading since like a long time ago, so I don't I don't know how other people feel. Um, and I said you you haven't done readings, but I'm kind of curious that um. You know, cartooning is such a, a solitary pursuit. Um, <clears throat> is there any aspect of like your interest in expressing yourself that's performative that you don't get out of doing comics, or do you feel like this is my niche, working in this particular thing? Uh, you know, solitary, and it, then it goes out, and someone may read it, and someone may not read it. Well, actually, for me, cartooning actually isn't really solitary because, like, I really only started doing it once I was a CC. I mean, like, I had been doing, like, what I used to call scribble comics, which were just, like, and then you just, like, had a comic, but it wasn't, like, any effort in it. And um, I, didn't, I didn't really start putting effort in the comics until I went to CCS, and I was just surrounded by this community. Well, I, also, I was also part of a, a, if you guys are local, there is a group here called Square City Comics, that is a bunch of local cartoonists that um, that uh, uh, meet together, and they used to have a drawing thing, but now they just hang out um, once a month at Phantom Comics and like talk comics, and it's really great. So like for me, comics hasn't really ever been solitary. Like I've always done it with other people. But has it been? But it wasn't performative. No, perform. No, no, no. Performative wise, I I think that comics is pretty much. I mean, there's always a persona you've got to put on when you're like presenting yourself to the world and your work to the world. So, but other than that, no, I I just keep it to comics. <coughs> Chris, you mentioned um, your other career doing storyboarding and working in uh, in that context, which is it's creative, but it's also not something you control. How much is the fact that sort of like uh, that you don't have control over that make doing your own autobiocomics all the more important? Uh, I mean, I just, I like writing comics, and I don't write comics at my day job, so I just <coughs> do them afterwards. So you don't, so there's no, like, like draining. It's like two different, completely different. Do, do, you, do you see your work stuff as being, um, a creative outlet, or is it is it like a, just a whole different part of your brain? It's like kind of a mixture of both. It kind of depends on like what I'm working on that day. Um, I actually I think it like sort of it like because I have to be creative constantly every day. Uh, it kind of makes writing the stuff afterwards easier because I'm already like sort of exercising those muscles throughout the whole day. So I was I was like super worried that it would be a huge drain and I would hate it and I would not want to draw afterwards, uh, but it's just kind of like different. Uh, that might change because I mean I'm it might change depending on like how the job goes. I don't know. I'm still kind of early in it. <laughs> not a do, you, <laughs> do you want to say the, Do you want to say the name of your other job? Oh, I storyboard. 
don't actually storyboard. I do revisions for a cartoon show called We Bear Bears. <laughs> <laughs> I just watched that for the first time yesterday in the hotel room. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, cool, we have cable. <laughs> it was really good. Oh, thanks. I like don't do a lot creatively on it at all. I like color the bears. <laughs> it's like wild. All three? Yeah, you gotta color all three of them. I don't know. It's crazy. That's why it's like, I don't know, I'm doing creative stuff like Sophia, you do a lot of illustration work. Mm -hmm. um, can you sort of talk, do you have that same kind of dichotomy? How, is it, how does that work for you? Do you have that um, same extra urge to do autobio after you've spent a lot of your creative energy doing uh, work for others, like for example, the cover of Sophia Magazine? Yeah, um, I definitely have the impulse to do comics even if I'm drawing full time. Um, uh, it's kind of like an itch that like won't go away. I try and put myself in my professional work sometimes, not literally, but like I try and make it creatively fulfilling and the two kind of feed into each other a bit. Um, I definitely feel like lessons I learn in comics benefit my editorial illustration and vice versa. Um, but it's hard to do both at once. What I wind up doing usually is because I'm a freelancer, like if I'm preparing for a festival, I'll, like take a week and just work on comics so that I'm not trying to switch brain modes while I'm working on something. Um, <coughs> so starting back with Gina, um, an interesting thing about autobi autobiographies, you know, there's the old dictum of that, like all autobiography is fiction and all fiction is autobiography. Um, oftentimes, and Sophia touched on this, the more specific you are about your experiences, the more other people find it relatable for mm -hmm. some reason. Can you talk about that phenomenon and like um, particular like times that it's really surprised you that this particular detail everyone was like resonated with, like, yeah, I feel exactly the same way, even though that exact same thing even happened with them. Do you want to start with Gina? Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there's there's like a famous phrase it's like universal in the specific or like something yeah. like that and I think that's a, like a really important part of like comedy too is like the more specific you make it to yourself yeah I don't know why why, why do you is. think that is oh I don't know deep down I want to hear everyone's like secrets and gossip um, so that's interesting to me and especially in autobio and I was kind of I do get like feedback from other women that are like, "Hey, buddy, I also can't get catch any dick," and I'm like, "Cool," <laughs> because there's not a big. Uh, I don't know. That's not a big. Uh, women that can't get laid aren't like typically portrayed as sympathetic characters in media. Usually, it's just like, "Oh, who's this chick?" Blah, like. <laughs> um, so that is that has been cool. I wasn't. I mean, it makes sense now that I've heard back from other women, but I wasn't expecting that at the time that there were other girls like me <laughs> that are frustrated. Um, so, and even if I hadn't heard from other women that felt the same way, um, yeah, j I'm sure I could, you know, write a thesis on like <laughs> why the why specific. Uh, details of your life are you know, I don't know I think I don't put a lot of like absolute truth and facts in my work um, but I think just like the underlying feelings I have come through and then people are able to relate to that <coughs> Sophia yeah um, uh, I did a comic uh, in March of 2015 called Sphincter that was about like um like ambivalence about sex and at the time when I was drawing it I was like this is the least relatable thing in the world everyone's gonna think it's really weird um it was really cathartic for me like I had to get it out there and I did it like in four days I was like I have to do this 
Um, I don't care if it doesn't sell or if people hate it. Um, but then when I actually got it out there, uh, people did come forward and were like, this is everything I've been afraid to talk about, and it was completely shocking. Um, and now when I think about it, like that probably was maybe my impulse in getting it out there, like just seeing if anyone would connect with it on any level. And in the process of publishing that and talking to people afterwards, I kind of like learned about, like I learned about Chris Krauss, the writer semiotician who kind of like writes about similar themes. Um, and all of these people in other fields, not comics necessarily, who touch on similar issues or movies about those issues, um, that I just don't know how I would have found otherwise because it's not particularly a mainstream theme. Um, so I'm grateful for that having happened, even though at the time I thought it was going to be a total aberration and no one would connect with it at all. <coughs> Chris? Uh, I don't know. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, when I write about like specific things that happen to me, I'm like, I want to be very clear about what is important going on here and I don't know people like it loud. it seems people really respond to like particular details like specific funny details like um uh, <coughs> commuter is a good example um yeah com well commuter is like funny because it's like it's all like stuff that happened to me and then like but it's it's like the subway so like everyone's also seen it so like i don't know like the whole like clipping your nails on the subway like everyone's seen that that's horrible <laughs> <laughs> anna so um i yeah i think it's interesting because like uh people relate to some of my work, but I don't think they relate to all of my work. And I think that they, there's still like a similar level of interest. So like, uh, This Isn't About You is a comic about how my relationship to bullying, where first I was a victim and then became a perpetrator, and then coming to terms with that as an adult. And I've gotten like really good feedback on it, but I have, and, and occasionally you get someone that says, oh yeah, I was a bully too. But I think most people aren't, willing to like ever admit that so i haven't really or if they or they just there aren't that many remorseful bullies out there so um <laughs> um so with that it's like that was one of my more like that's one of my better selling and more popular works but at the same time like I, that didn't get that didn't get like oh yeah me too kind of response as opposed to like my mental health comics where uh, they're very much just like me dealing with anxiety and depression depending on and people definitely relate to those even though they're incredibly specific to me and even if it's drawn like that people people relate to it do you feel that one of the appeals of your artwork in this is that it is like um, <clears throat> it allows people to kind of project themselves into the work with the simplicity of the of the line yeah I, I remember when I was first doing it because this was a part of my this was an assignment for school and I had tweeted that I had worried that like this character was completely unapproachable and like and that no one was going to be able to relate to this like this monster little doodle and um, a friend of mine named Dean Sadarsky uh, said that uh, he said that like everybody can project themselves onto like a square that says I'm sad like everyone can project <laughs> themselves on to a more abstract character and so I think like I think with that it definitely helps for sure yeah <coughs> um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the floor if anyone has any questions go ahead I would say that I'm like a disgustingly open book. So like people people know pretty much everything about me straight from the get go. Um, and so when I do work that uh, 
that is autobio. It's I usually have. They don't know the full story because I definitely flesh it out, but they see uh, they've like heard aspects of it. But the and it also doesn't feel like oh real people will read this. It's like oh I'll put this online and like people will like it online. And then I've, I'll never think about it again. <laughs> and then the uh, and then it's only when like people come up to me, I'm like oh I just shared something <laughs> 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 and uh, like and yeah. So that, and then I've had a few people say that like certain comics were brave and that just like scares the shit out of me in like the worst <laughs> way, just because I'm like, oh, I, I guess I revealed something I maybe should have thought about, so. <laughs> Anyone else wanna address that? Yeah, having, putting a story out there feels good. Cause you don't, have, you don't have to think about it. It's great. You should all do it. Everyone should write out a book. <laughs> yeah, I agree with, with Anna that I'm just naturally a very TMI person. And uh, I, uh, I think the reason I like fictionalize some of my work is because I already tell people very explicitly all the time what is going on with me. Like, If you look at the, panel, the page behind you, oh, I love this yeah. page. Thank you. Where, you know, you're, um, presumably your mom is like, you know, clean your room. Kind of going through this process. I remember, you said that this is more or less accurate on a yeah. number of days, and then it goes yeah. in this other direction. Yeah, um, yeah, because I think it would be you could just talk to me, and I'm like, sure, I'll tell you what you know I did. But uh, so putting it out there wasn't too much of a difficulty. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, just to tag on to that, I don't have much to add apart from what people said, but. Um, I just wanted to mention that there's something called a uh, 24-hour comics day where people do a comic for every hour that they're awake during the day. And a lot of people do this who like aren't cartoonists. Some illustrators do it. Um, and it's February 1st every year. So like if you like autobio and want to try your hand at it, it's a really easy way to like do something autobiographical without having to worry about picking a story from your life. And you can see how therapeutic it feels. Mm. Uh, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> I've spin lots of dangerous and stupid decisions to be like, no, nah, it'll be a comic, and like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my whoever inherits my estate from my bestselling work after I kill myself from like doing something stupid, uh, I'm like, it's worth it uh, <laughs> somehow. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've done many stupid things that I shouldn't have done, but I'm like, it's for my work, you know, like a <laughs> jackass. <so. laughs> I, I've done travel comics the last couple of times I've traveled, um, and I felt like they made the like airport breakdowns more bearable because I was like, this will be a poignant part of <laughs> the travel, <laughs> <laughs> and the reverse, which was like it made me definitely want to go out and go to every single museum I had planned just so I could. It's like the equivalent of do it for the vine, but it's like do it for the <laughs> autobiographical <laughs> comic. It's like. I have to look like I'm living my fullest life or whatever. But then the flip side of that is that I am honest about like, like I ate something really hot on the road in Osaka and then it was like so hot that I spit it into the road and I was like, I have to put that in the comic, I guess I'm humiliated that I did that. But <laughs> <laughs> Chris or Anna? What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> when I like when can't stop like thinking about <laughs> you spinning in the road. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it I'm was like, like takoyaki, and I was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> um, the question is like whether comics autobio has a prophylactic effect because if something bad happens oh. to you, you're like, it's not so bad because it will make a good comic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if something bad happens, I'll I don't always write about bad stuff. <laughs> I yeah. want to say no. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with I'm with I'm with her. I I definitely don't go. This will make a great comic. I'm just like, yeah. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, I I definitely don't feel better after something bad happens because it'll make a good story. Yeah, I, it, it's usually like if something bad happens, I'll be like, well, there's I can't forget about it. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, that, I mean, the natural follow-up to that is that, you know, if you experience something, do you think it's going to make a comic? This is the first question, but the follow-up is, do you ever self-consciously put yourself in situations in order to generate material for yourself? Gina, and, and we'll go first, then we'll go to Sophia. Oh, no. <laughs> You're yeah. nodding vigorously. I do. Well, because, like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I've crafted my whole persona as not being able to get laid, so I'm like, i got to be really slutty to, like, move my character forward, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, much to my mother's despair, <laughs> I'm out there trying but yeah, I think if I wasn't a cartoonist and was a successful adult, I'd be like, maybe scale it back a bit. Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm like, no, this is smart. Like, I'm <laughs> Sophia? I think, I think it's like a little misleading to say that you like put your life in a different situation for the sake of comics. It's more like your self is inextricable from your like authorial self. Uh. So like when I think about what to do with my life, I'm thinking about what's good for me, but because of the way my mind works, it's kind of like what is best for the story of my life, and then that by extension is like good for comics. <laughs> Since most people tend to think of their lives in terms of narrative anyway, they, yeah, just, exactly. don't, they yeah. just don't write it down. So you try and think of things that kind of fit experiences that will be like the logical next step in your evolution, and then those things will kind of fit narratively with whatever autobiographical stories you tell. Uh, let's see. Over here, front row. I can give an, a specific example of so I, yeah, so Sex Fantasy 7, which is the one that debuted this SPX, um, is about a vacation that I took with uh, the cartoonist Roman Muradov. Um, and I knew that like he would probably take some issue in how I portrayed him in the story. So I knew from the beginning that I was going to like check in with him at every step of writing it um, to make sure that he approved of it. So I did basically all of the pencils, and then I sent it to him. And what he did was he basically, and this wouldn't work for every story, but he every time he had a speech bubble, he rewrote his dialogue for the speech bubble. <laughs> but but it always had to like fit with the scene. And like we had different memories of what happened, <laughs> but it's not like he remembered going to a beach and I remembered going to a museum. Like we both knew that we were in that place and this thing happened. He just wanted to make sure that it was like his voice and not me remembering what he said. Um, and then I had to approve of what he said. And mm -hmm. there was a little bit of back and forth where I was like, are you sure that's what happened? I remember this. And then we settled on something that we both agreed on, which is probably still not what actually happened. But like, <laughs> as long as we <laughs> both can come to a consensus, like, no one's going to be unhappy about it. So, But again, that wouldn't work for every comic, uh, especially if I had to contact a bunch of people. But for this one, because it was someone that I'm friends with, um, it did work out OK. Anyone else? So, or, uh, or you, yeah, regarding this question, go ahead. Oh, so, um, yeah, I for the mental health comics, I actually just use letters, and because they're abstract characters, they don't even, like, people don't even know who they are, pretty much. Um, I mean, the person probably is like, oh, I remember this happening, and I know that's me, but, but for the most part, most of my comics are pretty much focused on myself anyway, so... Um, with the with the like but with the when I mentioned earlier like I when I did more emotionally wrought like fictional comics the one about me having a fallout with my friend um, I used her real name and she asked me to change it and I did I changed it to another name um, she's Thai so I changed it to another Thai name that I thought was pretty and um, um, like so yeah, it depends on the comic, because then for This Isn't About You, which is my bullying comic, I just kind of, I don't know, like, the people from high school's contact information, so I can't mm -hmm. be, like, running by them this, so I just kind of kept it as, like, oh, this is really what happened, but it, it really depends on, like, the story for me. Time for one more quick one. Uh, Red shirt?
Yeah. I've never had anyone steal anything from me. On, I'm first of all, I'm a pretty small fish, especially on this panel. I'm a very small fish, and <laughs> and um, but uh, I've never had anyone steal anything from me online. And I think part of the reason, honestly, is because I do multi-page work. I think that like I think that a lot of the stuff you see on Nine Gag is like a one-off strip, right. and and I think the fact that like my comics are like anywhere from like four to ten pages, like I think they are not even going to bother like cutting and pasting and putting it together. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I also think, like aesthetically, my stuff isn't necessarily the stuff that people on Nine Gag are gonna dig, are gonna are gonna dig as much. Like I'm not like a t I mean I love a lot of that like stereotypical web comic stuff, but like I don't draw that, so I I don't know. Like I haven't had anything stolen. I hope it happens. I hope that I am on Nine Gag as a new like Pepe figure. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia or Chris? Um, I, there was a page from my Lover's Only comic, which is six pages, but then they just cropped out a few panels, um, the sequence where I'm like making out with my girlfriend, and they put it on Tumblr, and like it was credited at first, but then people removed the credit, and it got like 100,000 notes. Oh, jeez. Um, because like high school girls making out is like the most relatable thing <laughs> in the entire <laughs> world, um, but I didn't care. comics aren't really online because uh, I just I print them and then they scan terribly so I kind of just give up <laughs> so I haven't had a lot of trouble with that <coughs> that is all the time we have for our panel please give a big round of applause <laughs> for our wonderful panelists